Hi, welcome. I am Ernest Green. I am the Artistic Director of Live Arts Maryland. And with me right now are three of our four soloists for the Mozart Requiem, uh, Jeffrey Gates, Oliver Mercer, Charicia Williams, and Larry Molinaro, who will be playing continuo on uh, the Eine Kleine Nacht music, the Mozart Ave Verum, and also in places, I believe, in the Mozart Requiem. Um, so please welcome our guests, and I would like to say welcome. Thank you for being here tonight. Um, it's great to see you all. So yeah. good to see you. Good to see you. Yeah. Good to see you. Yeah, and it's it's funny. I just I was telling uh, we were talking before we hit the record button. I uh, I of course know Jeffrey and I know Oliver and Larry and I are our old dear friends from way back. And I just met Charicia in New York when I was up there last weekend. Uh, we sat outside in the plaza at Lincoln Center. And so welcome uh, to your Annapolis debut. Um, we we try to keep it fun down here and make some good music, but we like to keep it fun. So welcome. Yes, thank you for having me. I'm so excited. Yeah. So anyway, so what I thought we would uh, what I thought we would start with is sort of talking a little bit about the uh, the Mozart Requiem, which is the big sort of marquee piece on this program. And we've as uh, we've moved this concert outside because of uh, um, because of, of COVID issues at Maryland Hall, and we want to keep everybody safe. But this piece um, is really um, is really sort of a, an interesting piece because it is, um, first of all, it is shrouded in mystery. And it is, uh, uh, it is a piece where there's not just one version, um, there are multiple versions of it. Um, and so um, we will do the Zeusmeyer uh, completion. Zeusmeyer was of course Mozart's uh, uh, assistant and, and pupil and he, um, he completed it, and it's probably the closest transcription to what Mozart would have done. So, um, anyway, I uh, uh, would you guys do you all have any thoughts about doing this piece? Um, let's start with Jeffrey. Well, uh, I have lots of thoughts. Um, the, the first thing that comes to mind, I, I think, to address the elephant in the room is the emotional, uh, you know, impact that a piece like this has in these times you know uh out after the the year and a half that we've experienced uh mm -hmm. to come to a funeral mass uh is it, it's definitely going to be an interesting experience right i'll say that and um you know Mo mozart is one of not if not my favorite composer um i think um the requiem has so many moments that are um just quintessentially mozart and just kind of like perfectly wrapped up in a bow um yeah and um you know i i i like to say that mozart uh within the structure that he was composing in was able to achieve uh incredibly artistic feats and mm -hmm. um i'm just uh privileged and grateful to sing his music whenever the opportunity arises so um yeah yeah i, I, I i'm I, not I, exactly sure <laughs> yeah what no, else to say no that's really beautifully said you, you talked about the emotional impact of this i have really incredibly vivid recollections of doing this piece um, the year after 9-11 as part of the, the worldwide rolling requiem. And we were one of the groups that did it in this region. Um, and prior to that, we had I had done the Mozart requiem, requiem a number of times and it was always very moving. But after doing that performance, it, it has ever since taken on a really different um, uh, sort of intensity for me. Um, there, mm -hmm. there is, uh, there are places in this that I just find incredibly moving and haunting. That that every time I do this piece, ever since then, um, um, you know, there's an intensity about it that there had not been before. Um, uh, Oliver, do you have a, what? Do you have any uh, thoughts? Um, 
Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I like what Jeff said, and I think we're all feeling a little bit of that um, as we go in to do this piece after the last 18 months. On a more personal level, it's, um, you know, it's a piece that I've been, I've been familiar with uh, from my childhood. Just, I think it, uh, it's one of those pieces um, that really has a presence in the, in the larger kind of um, po uh, popular world. Um, it's, almost in a, it's almost as famous in a way as, as, you know, as a lot of popular music, it features in a lot of movie scores. And as a child, I was very taken with the piece. My brother was a, a, a fantastic clarinetist and he, so we sort of obsessed over Mozart and his use of the winds and how that was all evolving. And, um, and, and as, you know, I've go, grown older and performed it more, um, I really, I, as much as I enjoy, uh, what I really enjoy about Mozart is whilst he was always kind of looking forward and almost <clears throat> writing movements that could be um, almost operatic in a way, some of the soloist movements he, at times can feel a little bit like you're almost in one of his operas doing one of the ensembles. And as much as he looked, for, looked forward in that direction, um, he also always, um, what always strikes me about Mozart is he took very seriously the older the older school of writing. He was obsessive about you know fugues. He loved Bach. He loved right exercising his uh, exercising his fugue practice and um, and uh, and sort of looking back to the older you know older masters. Um, even someone like Michael Haydn who wrote a, a very beautiful Requiem, which I'm sure you know, um, and how he kind of in a way quotes Michael Haydn and the Quam Olim Abrahe, that fugue subject, it's a oh, little, yeah. it's a sure. little similarities in that, um, in how the Mozart goes, Quam Olim Abrahe, bro. Me see, oh, that's the Michael Haydn. See, they're so similar. Get, they're so similar, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and then, um, uh, and so I just love, uh, I love how at the same time, he, he, he seemed to be able to do it all. He was so gifted. Right. just innately gifted and composing he could he could do things he could kind of break through boundaries and do new things but while, whilst at the same time satisfying all of those older practices um writing fugues just brilliantly i mean you see so many composers try their hand at writing the fugue and they see what bach did and they think oh, i could do what bach did and then, you know sometimes it goes well sometimes not so well but um his ability you know his abilities to do both things were you know we were true it's a it's a cliche but he truly was a genius in that yeah. remark obviously yeah. yeah so you know, you know i'm just uh, i'm reading uh and 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 teaching from the twyla tharp book the creative habit and she makes a point of talking extensively about mozart not just being this genius that we all acknowledge him to be but somebody who actually worked incredibly hard at his craft he didn't just it, it wasn't like he was just kissed on the back of the head by god he really he studied he worked he knew his re repertoire we were talking last night at the rehearsal when we got to the um uh and i and i keep singing the wrong word when we do this in rehearsal because the the beginning of the rex tremende reminds me so much of the opening chords in the chorus from the saint john the box saint john so instead of hair, 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 you have Rex, Rex, Rex. Um, and there's, there's a lot of that. And that, that whole piece is, is a very um, Baroque uh, in terms of this. So uh, I think it's, and I think that first fugue, the Curie, which then is repeated as the Cum Sancto, is one of the most brilliant fugues uh, that he ever wrote. Uh, it's amazing. It's amazing. And he really, you know, there's that famous story when he, he went to a concert where uh, that Bach once had Zing it, Dame Heron was performed and he was, he was blown away by it. He was humbled by it. So I think you're right. He was someone who who was interested in always working hard and working on his craft. It, yeah, it wasn't just um, he wasn't just a sort of fanciful genius. He did work very hard. Yeah, Sharicia, what are your? Do you have any any thoughts or uh, you've yeah. done, you've, you've sort of <laughs> recently done this as a chorister as well? So you you're coming from yes, both exactly. Sides. I think we've all done right, this before, right. <laughs> Um, for me, I think what I mostly love about Mozart in general is that he's a very expressive composer. You know exactly how he wants to express each of the texts, not just like in the vocal lines, but also with how the orchestra plays along with like whatever the soloists are singing or whether whatever the choir is singing. It's almost as if it's like this like call and response type of thing. Like mm -hmm. you'll hear the melody first sure. in the orchestra and then we repeat it, but just, it's just the way he goes about it. It's always very expressive. And what I love about it is for something that's just, you know, a requiem is usually like very sad. He just has these glorious moments with like the song choose where out of nowhere, it's like, 
out of something that could be so sad it's like wow like you find joy in it right um and I think that's what I like love about like it's my favorite requiem because out of you know the few that I do know it has some really joyous parts in it that it's just like you would forget that it's even a requiem you just think it's like almost an opera chorus almost right well, and you get these beautiful lines, uh, Charissa, you get uh, out of the middle of nowhere, um, you get mm-hmm. these beautiful lines in the soprano that just sort of take us to another place. And it usually is the soprano who leads us to this new place. It happens in the first movement. It happens uh, It happens in the Qua Mole Mabrehe. Um, so you really take us in a new direction each time you come in. Yeah. Which I think is cool. You know, it's um, 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 you know, Larry and we were taught Larry, uh, Larry and I were talking the other night, and one of the things, uh, Oliver, you mentioned the Kwamoli Mabrehe, uh, and talking about this, and at the end, Larry and I, Larry and I are sort of uh, uh, hyper. <laughs> he's, I think he's grinning. Fixated. I think fixated, fixated, hyper focused <laughs> on the uh, fixated. fixated on the lamento base of uh, that we inherited from Monteverdi. And, you know, at the end of this, Larry, do you want to, do you want to jump oh, in? I'm just, I was just pointing out at the very end of the, um, of both sections, right? So at the end of the initial alpha story, and then after the hostias, um, you get the lamento bass as the final cadence. Yeah. It's just, you have um, the sending bass line. And it's the only time it happens. Yeah. So I, I don't think that was left up to chance. I, I don't think it is either. So there's so much of this stuff. You know, one of the things for me that, uh, you know, every time we do the Mozart Requiem, um, somebody invariably um, talks about, you know, the, the sort of the, the legend that grew out of Amadeus, you know, and, and, um, and you know, Don Giovanni. I, I've conducted Giovanni many, 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 many times. I did a, uh, I've done really good productions and I've done really not so good productions, um, which I'm, you know, trying to not for trying to not remember, but um, um, you know, it, it, those those these pieces were written about three and a half years apart or three years apart, so they're not contemporaneous as you would you would you know most of our audience sort of may think that they happened very close together, which they did not, but there is a lot of uh, and and Teresa, you mentioned the. Uh, the uh, the orchestra and the way the orchestra works. There's a lot of writing, and Oliver, you mentioned the clarinets. There's a lot of the way that Mozart uses those instruments that he does in Giovanni that you can see this connection here. Um, and uh, how how is it? Um, um, so just sort of round the room real quick. Uh, let's let, let's go backwards. Let's start with Teresa, and I'll work uh, from right to left on my screen. Um, do you, what is your what is the your favorite part of this piece? Uh, to say, what is your favorite moment in this piece? Um, for sure, the Benedictus. Ah, it's the- my favorite part. Yes, yeah. <laughs> I mean, partially because there's uh, this one section where the soprano just soars oh, above I, everybody else. I know which. I know which one you mean. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and Oliver. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's 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 pretty good. And interestingly, that's mostly Zeusmeyer. I mean, but it's great, and it just goes to show you just how 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 much of an influence mozart was on the people in his world you know it's but the benedictus is wonderful it really is it used to be a movement that i struggled with as a conductor to try to figure out how to make it work and it's become uh, a really favorite moment of mine so yeah i agree with you i'm with you um oliver i think i know what you're going to say but i'm going to ask you anyway what is your uh see if i remember correctly uh, yeah, no, we, I think we talked about it. I love the, um, it took me a while to come around to it, but I love the recordare. I just, I don't absolutely, I don't even know why really. I just, I, uh, over the years, um, I don't know, just the way everything plays out between the soloists and sort of uh, in, in the extended nature of it, I just really love. And um, and then the way, it, the way it ends, the way it ends with the voices just is, uh, is just really beautiful to me. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think so. You know, I, um, I, I, there are Mozart's choral writing um, is so good, and his quartet writing is also so beautiful. We had, I remember a rehearsal years ago. We were working on the recordare, and the pianist was uh, was running late, so we just started, and we just sang it. I gave him the pitches, and off we went. 
Um, and it, it basically, as we did it, it made a beautiful motet. Um, and you know, it, it, it is so the writing is so good. I'll tell you another piece that works very similarly. You can do the same thing with the uh, Mozart, with the Ave Verum. You can just skip, you can take the orchestra out and sing it as a, as a motet and it works beautifully it's the writing and in order for that to work the writing has to be absolutely great so i i so far i agree with both of you those are um jeff what do you, um what what, do you, what is your what is your moment in this piece There's well so i think many. there are uh a few moments as iconic for uh you know baritone solos as the introduction <laughs> yeah the Mero. yeah but um i don't think that's quite my favorite i was actually the first thing that came to mind was the record daughter as well yeah. how it just demonstrates how subtly mozart plays with texture and it just goes so seamlessly from voice to voice and it, it's just like this uh weaving together of sound that just creates like a, a soft blanket <laughs> and um it's it's just really um you know, when when I can lock in with with the other soloists, it's just one of the most gratifying experiences to perform. Um, but uh, also, my the other moment that sticks out to me because I am a fan of drama <laughs> is the uh, the DSC, right? Uh, and uh, uh, it's oh. just such a just it, that it, to me is. The iconic moment of the requiem um it's just um you know just it, 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 it to me it's it's the climax and um having sung in the chorus um it's one of my favorite moments to experience mm -hmm. um and it's just exciting yeah and um I, I did think of uh, one thing when you were talking about the uh, the similarities between the Requiem and uh, a piece like Don Giovanni. And when you were talking about the instrumentation similarities, I immediately thought of the trombone mm -hmm. and how both of these pieces are really at their core, you know, um, an exploration of mortality and in Don Giovanni when that comes when that theme appears you know he he smacks you over the head with that trombone right uh you yeah. know and uh that really doesn't appear outside of sacred music at the time right and exactly. um so I I feel like he brilliantly used that to kind of put this fear of our mortality into the music. And um, I, I just love how uh, just, just little details like that. Yeah. Um, it, it's almost, it's subconscious. You don't even really think about it, but uh, it, 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 it's one of those moments that gives you goosebumps. Yeah. When the trombones appear in the graveyard scene of Giovanni, yes. it, it is truly bone chilling it is just mm -hmm. it is it and 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 it is um uh it never never ceases to give me goosebumps just my just in the extreme it is it is that you know and it's, it's very interesting what um you know mozart was very um very careful about where he did and did not use um um trombones um it was um you know it's the the trombones being a, 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 an instrument used for sacred sacred music uh, uh and beethoven would inherit that um uh, and we don't see trombones in symphonies until the fifth symphony and they don't come until the c major we finally get c major in the last movement i mean they're they really you know they they knew their they knew what they were inheriting you know which is amazing so um yeah, I, I have to say I agree with all of you. These are these are all favorite moments of mine. I think, um, you know, the the I, I think the recordare is definitely mine. I actually love the introit, um, and I love the way that he uses the bassoons and then he adds the basset horn 
um, which will use modern clarinets, especially outside. Um, but um, I love the way he, um, he starts weaving those instruments in one by one. And then all of a sudden, just before the chorus entrance, we have the trombones come in to set the stage before they begin playing Call Apart with the, with the chorus. And that, that, to me is, uh, that, to me, is just genius, genius, genius. So, um, well, I'm excited to have the, to work on this with you guys. And then let me jump over to Larry. Larry is going to play... Uh, we're going to do something a little interesting with Ina Kleine Nacht music. I've uh, wanted to do this with um, Ina Kleine for years. I've, as I've gotten older, um, I'm more and more convinced that the symphonies and the early instrumental music, certainly up through, you know, the the symphony, the, the symphony twenty nine, maybe maybe even thirty thirty one, should really have continuo in the orchestra because they're written in a way that uh, did, did that. And when I told Larry that I was doing Ina Kleina and I said, what do you think about doing, uh, you know, adding a, uh, uh, a clavier uh, sound to the, to the orchestra texture? And Larry said, you know, yeah, let's do it. Um, and uh, so I think we're gonna, so we're, I've never done Ina Kleina knock music this way with the, uh, with, the uh, uh, with a harpsichord uh, or, or a, a clavier in the back, but I think, places like excuse me the second movement where you have those two pickups beam bomb brum it just it just really uh calls out for doing that so i think it's going to be you know this will be sort of like uh uh this will be like you know doing one of the serenades outside you know we'll do it instead of on the duke's lawn we'll do it in front of maryland hall so larry what do you think yeah i i mean i no, I agree. I don't know that I would say they should have continuo, but they certainly could, right? Or or can, and it's not out of character. Um, maybe by what is it, seventeen eighty seven or so? Yeah. Um, it's probably a little late, but certainly the early symphonies, not just Mozart, but you know, through the yeah. Mannheim school, yeah. had keyboard continuo. And so, you know, in our spirit of sort of improvisation, I think uh, why not? And uh, I think you and I talked about if we can do it as opposed to using a harpsichord sound since we're outside and we'll be availing ourselves of digital technology. Um, I have a sample set from a 1792 Johann Stein, Johann Andreas Stein piano, forte piano. And it'd be fun to use that uh, in the background. So it'll be, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great sample set. Yeah. And, but, um, yeah, Larry um, mentioned, Teresa, you haven't, uh, you haven't had to, to the, the uh, and uh, Jeff, you've, you've worked with Larry before too, but we, with Bach Plus especially, we really experiment and try different things uh, in terms of continual. I still actually, Larry was thinking about the Brandenburg uh, 4 that we did years ago with, I think, Sean and Kim, where we used the uh, positif organ instead of the harpsichord for it, which I thought was absolutely delightful. Um, so we kind of play around with things like that. Um, Larry, while you're, while we're, you know, sort of talking with you about this, tell us what that, that wonderful instrument behind you is, because, um, oh, <laughs> because uh, um, some of it's you a may clavichord. Have... Yeah, yeah, so um, I don't know if you can hear it, but It's a, it's a quiet instrument. CPE Bach loved the clavichord. What I love about it is that you can do pitch bends. So my daughter and I um, are experimenting with Arabic modes. She's uh, a Middle Eastern scholar and uh, loves all things Arabic. She's a cellist and so we do some improvisation where we use some of the Arabic modes where you have, you know, the half flats and the basically 24 microtones. So wow. I, that, I, I won't bring that though. To, uh, to I don't know. You know what? I think we could stick a mic on it. I think it'd be great. You know, and what those I actually work pretty well, you know, with those, I will bring it to the studio sometime. Yeah. You know. with, the, with the ability to bend pitches, you know, we could sort of play some stuff off Abbey road and uh, uh, the white album. Um, you know, I'm all for it. You know, so uh, I think I just dated myself there. Uh, I was going to say, you know, it's, it's about time for you to do a uh, blues series. 
Oh, you know what? It's coming. It's totally coming. We've been doing. Yeah, Jeff, you and Oliver seen this. Teresa, you you haven't been down here yet, but Jeff, you got to wait till you see the 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 place where we the new studio that we have at the Annapolis Mall. Um, and actually, when you get down here next week, I still have the key to the new space, and I'll show you. This is like you know a big surprise, but but I'll show you what's next. I'll give you a sneak preview. So anyway, um, this is going to be fun. I have kept you all way too long. Um, but I am so excited to see you and I'm glad, thank you for sharing your thoughts. Um, and, uh, so I hope our friends and, and, and live arts people will come back, uh, next Saturday to see, uh, the Mozart Requiem as we sort of remember a year of loss. Uh, but at the same time, look ahead, maybe to a brighter future, uh, with some other pieces and, uh, wonderful solos and our mezzo soloist Catherine Davis is not here tonight. Uh, because she has a uh, is doing a site visit for another performance, um, which we're all trying. We're all moving things all over the place. Nothing is where it was scheduled originally. So um, we'll do another interview with her later. And uh, yeah, Jeff, I think you mentioned Catherine sang with us, uh, sang this with us the last time, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, a few years ago when we did it uh, downtown Annapolis. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, anyway, this will be good, and I can't wait to see you all down here in Annapolis. Thank you so much for coming, and I will see you next week. So thank right, you. Thank all you. For coming. Thank you thank so you. much. Thanks. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Take care.